Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Paul Chadwick. I'm the clinical director at the, the Royal College of Podiatry, and it's a great honor to be on this Legs Matter um, webinar this evening, where we're, I'm pleased to say we've got Dr. Una Adderley, who's the National Wound Care Strategy Lead, and uh, Tracy Goodwin, who's been a, a member of the uh, Legs Matter campaign since its conception, has also been one of the board members on the um, National Wound Care Strategy. So we're very lucky to have everybody here. Uh, to have a conversation and really for you to ask questions of Una and Tracy about the National Wound Care Strategy, any, any queries you may have about it, any impact. If you're a patient, what do you think it will mean for you? If you're a clinician, a doctor, a GP, a nurse, please just pop questions in the chat and I'm sure Una or Tracy will be able to answer them for you. So welcome, Tracy. Welcome, Una. Um, I'm going to start off with you, Una, if that's OK. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about the, the National Wound Care Strategy, where it's come from and what its aims are? Yes, happy to do so. Um, thank you very much for the invitation this evening. Um, it's, it's lovely to be able to share our work because I do think it's so very, very important we get this sorted. In fact, I was involved with Legs Matter right from the beginning and only sort of moved over when I got this post because there's only so much you can do in a day. Um, but I think the Legs Matter campaign really complements the work we're trying to do as well. So we very much see this as a partnership. So the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, well, firstly, just to say, it's been commissioned from NHS England, although it's being delivered by the Academic Health Science Network. So it is actually a, a programme for England only. Having said that, we are very happy to share and we poach quite unashamedly from the other countries. So the, the logic is why not if why not learn from each other and work together? So um, I just I just put that out there so people understand. But um, as I say, lots of good ideas are produced in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And equally, I think we're doing some good stuff, which we know those countries are also keeping a close eye on, so we're happy to do that. So um, the programme started three years ago, back in 2018. It's, it's for the first couple of years, it was really, a, it's still a small programme, but we are, we are hitting, um, we're, we're hitting high with our very limited resources. Uh, we started with just a very small commission of just 250K, which trust me, I know it sounds a lot, but it doesn't buy much when it comes to staff and everything else. Um, but then in 2020, we were lucky to get long term fund and long term plan funding, which took us up to a whopping just under a million pounds a year, um, which has been enormously helpful and has allowed us to actually recruit a small team to work with us. So now we're able to do that much more. And we were very lucky um, earlier this year that um, we also um, achieved another million um, because they were very impressed with the work we we're doing around data and digital. So we've um, been able to expand um, our work in that area, which we see as absolutely vital. We are interested, our priority is to look at wounds that are, um, that are to look at um, lower limb wounds, pressure ulcers and um, surgical wounds. But I'm obviously for this talk going to be focusing just on um, lower limb wounds. Um, the problem is huge, as you're probably aware. Um, there are a very large number of people with lower limb wounds. It's, um, it accounts, I think when I last looked, it accounts for about three quarters of the spend on wound care is actually to do with lower limb. And most of it is um, hits um, community services, community nursing in particular, but podiatry as well, of course, and general practice. Um, they are carrying the, the biggest burden of wound care. And that's certainly where most patients with lower limb, where most people receive their care from. Um, we know there is a problem with unwarranted variation. Um, too few people are getting the care that is um, supported by good quality research evidence. And people are being distracted with other types of care, which may be not be anywhere near as effective. So we know we've got this big problem of unwarranted variation. And when I first came to post, I mean, I've worked in this area a long time, but I assumed that the it was probably something to do with that we have got an aging population. And as we know, lower limb wounds are, are thought to be predominantly an issue with aging. But I've only got Tracy sitting there screen. It was the epitome of youth to prove that really isn't the case. And there are far more people like Tracy around, unfortunately, who have problems with their legs from much earlier on in their lives. I was, I was, I was, I'll tell you something, Tracy, I was delighted. Um, a couple of weekends away ago, I was away in Liverpool with some friends for, a, had a great fun weekend celebrating a friend's birthday. 
and we were sharing a hotel room and one, one of my friends got out her compression socks to put on um, as we were getting dressed. It was a bit like the girl's dorm, but there we go. And I looked at her in amazement and she's not a tissue viability nurse. She said, oh, I've got these little veins. She said, if I don't look after my legs, I might get bigger problems. And I thought, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful if that message was getting out to people that actually look after it now and it'll stop you getting problems further down, or at least it'll reduce the risk of you getting big problems further down. I thought that was really interesting. Maybe she'd live, um, she's been my friend for too long, but I, we don't often talk about wound care. I think she just, she'd read something somewhere and she was doing the right thing. And that was, that's hugely cheering, to be honest. So what are we doing? So we are, we know that um, there are two issues really. Well, two big issues. As I've already alluded to the fact that people with lower limb wounds, particularly those with problems with their veins, aren't getting the care which we know makes a difference. But there's also a big problem around foot wounds in that if you've got diabetes, I'm told there is a very good chance you actually get into a diabetic foot clinic these days. I think it's about 97% of services now have diabetic foot clinics. But in most of those, I'm told, they are not open to people with other types of unless you've got, you know, to people who haven't got diabetes. And we know there are as many people out there with foot ulcers without diabetes as there are with diabetes. And unfortunately, the outcomes are not are equally poor for them. So we know there's a real issue about trying to get some equity of care for those people. So we've got a big problem. We've got some research out there which tells us what we should be doing it, and we're not doing it. And when we started to look into this, I mean, I, I, my, my doctoral work some years ago was around decision making for this. And actually, I thought it might be down at individual clinician level. Is it, is it that people don't know what to do? Sometimes it is that. But quite often, there are quite a lot of people out there who do know what to do. But the service, the way our services are organised at the moment means it's very, very difficult for them to do the right thing. There are quite a lot of community nurses out there who know that if you get somebody with a leg ulcer, that patient should have a Doppler and should be into compression. But they have so much coming at them at the moment. And I've, I've been there myself as a district nurse. If it's Friday afternoon and you've got somebody who's maybe terminally ill in pain, you've got to get there and get the syringe driver sorted. You get a phone call, somebody has not had their bowels open for a week. You can't let them go over the weekend. You've got to go and sort that as well. And so the patient that you wanted to get to, to get that leg ulcer assessment done, just falls off the list. And they fall off the list repeatedly because that time is not protective for those patients. And wounds get slow, well, not always slowly, but gradually they get worse and worse because people haven't got the time to get there or they think they haven't got the time to put the compression on. And the irony is that actually, if you saw those patients fast and early, you'd probably get them looking after their own wounds themselves because the wound wouldn't be that big at that point in time. And you could turn the situation around and you could take the pressure off. So that's what we are trying to do something about is get those services organized. Another example is um, you may see somebody, you may not recognize they've got lymphedema or maybe you do recognize they've got lymphedema, but try you may not have a service that accepts patients with lymphedema problems unless they've got cancer. So what do you do with your patient? And it's a skilled thing to try and sort out lymphedema. So that's the problem. I've already talked about the problem with people with foot ulcers, getting to podiatrists like Paul and his colleagues. We know who we need to get them to, but the service, you know, we can't get access to the services. We can't get the referrals. We know we should be referring to um, vascular surgeons for endovenous ablation. But the varicose vein guidelines have been misinterpreted and in some areas have a blanket ban on referral for anything to do with veins. So what do you do if you work in an area like that where they won't let you make the referral? So there's all these issues, and I probably missed some others off, but there's all these issues we really have to get sorted at, at a service level, so that the clinicians working in those services can actually get patients the care they need at the right time and early on in the journey, so it makes most impact. That's a lot of work. I could, as you said, I could probably go on for a lot longer, but I thought I'd better stop talking at that point. <laughs> no, it's always interesting to hear you, Una, and, and that you've really articulated the sort of size of the problem that the National Wound Care Strategy has faced. I'll bring Tracy in now just to ask a question about how have patients really impacted on the National Wound Care Strategy? What's been your role? I think the National Wound Care Strategy Programme is all about putting the patients at the heart of what they're trying to do, and I don't think that would be possible without seeking the thoughts and opinions of either patients that have experienced it 
or those that have cared for people that have had the, those lower limb issues. Um, they, the, you know, the National Wound Care Strategy is looking at in, improving care for patients um, and without the say of the patient saying what it is they actually need, not what the clinicians think they need, um, how can that be done? So as patients and carers that we have around the table at the National Wound Care um, Strategy, we've had a say in, in everything really. We've been there in every meeting. Um, we've had a say in the patient resources that they're trying to put out and we've helped to shape the recommendations um, and we have felt really a big part of it because the patient that that's what the National Wound Care is trying to do is, is trying to put the patient at the heart of it as I say and, and give them excellent care every time no matter where they are in the country. Yeah I mean I think I think it's quite revolutionary in the way that Una and the team at the National Wound Care Strategy have involved patients in this delivery of care because, as you said, Tracy, it's, they're, the, they're the people that will be suffering these problems and complications. And, you know, I see patients on a daily basis with, with foot ulceration that have not been managed effectively and, and really need support and help. And, and we need patients to tell us how they need that help and support within, within mm. the services that we deliver them through. Just a quick call to everybody. It's very not very often you get the opportunity to ask Una any question and Tracy any questions that you you want. So she's here. It's, it's question time for Una and for Tracy. So please pop them in the chat or pop them in the Q and A box, and um, I'm sure Una and Tracy will, will answer the questions. So please do take this opportunity. We'd be very lucky to have uh, both the panelists on this evening, and um, you know I, I would encourage you to think about what kind of questions you've always wanted to ask. So, Una, you've talked very much about the, the problems and, and, the, and the, the size of the problem. What, the, what is the National Wound Care Strategy actually doing about that? What's the, what have been the, the stages and where, what's the next steps, what we're we hoping to achieve? Hmm. Well, I'll just pick up something first from Tracy, what Tracy said about the patient involvement. What I think has been an interesting learning for us is that although we've tried to involve patients um, right from the beginning, and I'm, I'm glad you feel involved because that's really very much our aim, but we've also realised that we lack, as clin and most of us are clinicians, we lack expertise in actually helping patients voice their concerns. So one of the things we've done very recently is we've actually um, commissioned um, the Patient Experience Network to work with us because they have expertise in helping patients work in programmes like this. And I think that's been learning both for yourself, Tracy, and for us together, is that actually um, there's something to be said for having the right expert to actually help make things happen. And somebody, as I can see, thank you, Marie, you've asked, how were the experts by experience the patients and carers recruited? Um, basically, we put out a call, we have advertised, we've said, please come and, you know, please come and speak to us and volunteer. And in fact, that fits nicely into what I was just saying about the patient experience network, because we have now passed that recruitment of patients and carers to that to those people who are expert in working in this sphere, which I'm not, I mean, I'm very good. I think I'm reasonably good at communicating with patients as a clinician, but I'm not a patient facilitator by background. And I've recognized that there is a real skill set around that. So if you are interested in getting involved, please come and have a look at our website. Um, I did say just Google it, but actually we've just got a new website. So Googling it doesn't work terribly well at the moment. But if you put in, I think it's um, at new, uh, it's Nat Woundstrat at, oh gosh, I should be able to tell you, it's not, not um, it's www.nationalwoundcarestrategy.net. If you get that in, you'll find us. And you should find some information on there about it. Or just email me and I will put you in touch. If you've got patients or carers who we think would be interested in joining Tracy, because we, we'd like to get you some more chums, wouldn't we, Tracy? <laughs> we could do it some more people because you worked your backside off trying to help us. We would be very, we're very um, up to more help. Sorry, Paul, I, I crashed your question then. No, that was a great guess. Uh, it's more about what's what we're doing going to do next, really. You know what's right. happened so far, and 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 what's the next stages, really. Right. Yes. Well, what we are doing next is we have been recruiting what we're calling first tranche implementation sites. We were given. We were. Um, I, it turns out I'm quite good at making a some relatively small amount of money go um, much further. Um, so what we have done is we have recruited. Um, one site in each of the NHS England regions to act as a site that we're working extremely closely with to try and understand the challenges of implementation. You'll probably know from other programmes, it's all very well a national programme coming up with all these good ideas about you should do this and you should do that. Actually making it happen and making it stick 
is really, really hard work. And we are really into sustainability, as in I want the work that we do to be here in 10, 20 years time as I get older as well and might well need to have good care out there. So I've got a personal investment in this. So what we are doing is working with those first tranche implementation sites. Um, we've got four so far. We've got one up in um, the northwest in Manchester, one in the northeast in Hull, one in the southwest Livewell, one in um, east of England, which is mid and south Essex. We've just come online and one down in the southeast in Kent. And we're just in process of recruiting one in London. So if you're in London, you're interested in this, please, you know, please go and have a look at our website and information will be there. Um, we are looking with these services about how to implement dedicated wound care clinics staffed by people who've got the time, knowledge and skills to deliver the right care. It's a bit of a novel idea in the NHS, but let's give it a go. You know, trying to get the right people who know what they're doing, doing stuff for the right patients. You know, who knows, it might catch on. Um, so we're trying to make sure that those patients have um, that, um, have that, um, well, I can see your questions, Marie. I'll come back when I've just finished this little bit and work through those, if that's all right. Um, the, um, so by doing that, we're looking at implementation of these dedicated wound care services and running out the education for those people running those services. Now, I don't know if you've seen, but we've actually got some free to access online education already out there, which we've developed with Health Education England. So those of you, if there's anyone on the line who's a generalist and you think, I really don't know much about this and I need to know more, please go and have a look. They should be free to access to anybody. You do have to sign up, but they are high quality. They're getting rave reviews, which apparently we're getting unexpectedly, not unexpectedly, but very, very positive feedback, high, much higher positive um, responses than is necessarily the case. So we, it appears that what we've done is acceptable and good. But we know we need education for people running the clinics as well, because that's a slightly higher level. So and they're not, we're not expecting these services to be run by tissue viability nurses. We're expecting those people to get their education from universities, master's level education. But there is a need for education in this middle gap. So that's what we're doing with those sites. We're also getting them to adopt mobile NHS compliant mobile digital technology, because too many services still work just on paper. And we think you, you need the technology, the sort of technology we're using now or in our normal lives needs to be embedded in wound care. Um, so we're finding ways to actually test out some of these new products, IT products that are out there and to, to wrestle with the challenge of getting interoperability. So if you're seeing somebody in your own home and receiving care there and they're putting data into an app, that data is secure, but can be drawn into your record. So your GP knows what's going on. And also, if you're also seeing, say, you're under the vascular surgeons, they can also uh, get this interoperability so that we can all see what's going on. And as a patient, you don't have to keep telling the same different people the same thing over and over again, and nobody seems to know how it joins up. It's a challenge, but it can be done. And so we're working with the sites to look at that. And we believe that if we can get that sorted, then evidence-based care should flow because it will support all of that. <clears throat> However, we only have enough funding at the moment for seven sites. And we are aware there's a lot of people out there also wanting to move faster. So we're just setting up at the moment what we're calling at the moment a learning collaborative. That name may change, but we're inviting organisations who want to improve care to sign up and work with us so they can get access to the fast learning that we are getting from these sites. Um, and so far, yesterday I was told we've had 61 organisations already want to work with us, which is absolutely brilliant. We're hoping we're going to get some more funding because you can imagine we're a tiny team. So in order to support those sort of people, we, we, we can only do so much with such a tiny team. And lower limb is only one third of what we're supposed to be doing. We've also got the pressure off and stuff and everything else. But we are hoping that... Um, we're going to get additional funding to support that. But either way, we'll find a way because that's what we do. We'll find a way to make it happen. Do you want me to have a look at some of these chat questions, Paul? Yeah, that'd be good, Luna, actually. And, and, and Tracy wants to join in if she feels she can to some of them as yeah. well. Um, right do you want, have you got them? Uh, well, there was a question, yeah. how do you plan to level regional differences in care? Which I think yeah. you've just sort of touched on, but 
I've touched on that. We we will not be, it, it is going to be, we think it's going to come down to commissioning. We think that the only way we're going to get better, and actually it's not just a regional difference. What we're finding is you can have an area, for argument's sake, like Manchester, they have excellent care in one patch, but just down the road, it's nothing like that at all. So it's not just regional differences, it's differences within localities. But what we're hoping is if we can work out what good looks like and how to make it happen, then nobody, you know, there's a bit of nudge theory going on here that actually if you've got somebody up the road who's doing really well, generally people say we want some of that. But also um, the commissioners will also say, well, how come they're getting these results and you're not? Until we get the data to measure it, it's very difficult to do quality improvement. But we are developing the metrics at the moment. We're focusing on the clinical metrics but we're moving on to workforce and productivity metrics and all the others and product metrics so that we can actually do quality improvement and do it in a way that's meaningful. And we're also engaging with what's at the moment is the model hospital that's going to be the model health system, which is the data system that will enable organisations to measure what's going on in their organisation and benchmark themselves against others. So it's not straightforward. If it was easy, it would have been done already. I know that's a cliche, but it's so true. Um, but it's really multifaceted. And that's how we're approaching it, is to try and deal with all these little bits of the jigsaw and bring them together into a whole. Um, I hope that it's maybe not a neat answer, but I hope that answers it. Um, oh, can I just pick this one up with um, Tracy? Una, the one about how, yes. what do you know about the challenges young persons face with chronic wounds? I think, Tracy, you might be the best person to answer that mm -hmm. in terms of the lived experience, and then Una might give us the professional view. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, um, it was it was really difficult. I had a young family at the time, um, so there were a lot of challenges um, I faced. Um, first of all, with the compression bandaging, I couldn't get any shoes um, that fit over it. So obviously it's someone who's in the 20s doesn't necessarily want the big shoes that they talk about oh you can get these big shoes with velcro um but as it was the only shoe I could find that to go over the four layer bandaging was flip-flops and I remember when I had the ulcer I was walking in flip-flops before I could drive and that was even in the snow um in all weathers it was the only shoe I could get over so that's a massive challenge and um, things that I couldn't do with the children um it was a big challenge for me because I couldn't do things like soft play I couldn't go swimming um, things like uh, ice skating, just anything that required a different footwear or anything that I could possibly um, damage my leg doing. Um, so that affected me a lot as well. And then sort of problems as a younger person with things like not feeling um, that you can wear fashionable clothes. I know it sounds trivial, but it's not. When you're in your 20s, you know, you, you want to be able to feel your age. And when you've got sort of a, a leg condition where you're having to wear the, the compression bandaging, you end up feeling... A lot older than you are um, and obviously being on a lot of pain relief as well that was a challenge because I found it difficult to sort of continue with everyday tasks because I was having to take so much pain relief just to get through the day to look after the children um, and I think sometimes when people think of leg ulcers they will think generally of older people that might not have those same kind of struggles there'll be different struggles of course um, but I don't think first and foremost people think how do you manage with a leg ulcer and push in a push chair or how do you manage with a leg ulcer when you've got a dog to walk and and just those kind of um issues really that perhaps and and working as well you know a lot of older people will be retired um and so for me it did affect my whole career I actually wanted to be a nurse um and I had to give up my nurse training because I couldn't stand for long periods of time um, and as it is, my husband and I set up our own business and I could work from home. But had I not been able to do that, I don't know how I would have carried on having a full time job because of all the hospital appointments I had to go to because of my leg leaking through the bandaging, the smell. Um, the, I wouldn't have been able to wear certain uniforms, certain shoes. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of struggles, I think, for younger people that have those conditions. So this, this is a truly um, moving story that Tracy listened to it and listened to the impact that condition has on younger people I, mean, I remember a patient uh, when I worked in, um, at my previous employment and we did we actually videoed her in the end because of mo a story about her impact as a, with a young family and having foot disease and diabetic foot disease and not being able to walk and not being able to wear the shoes that she wanted and getting married in shoes that she didn't want to get married in it's, it's really quite unless you start listening to those stories you don't really truly understand the impact that um, lower limb conditions can have 
Una, do you have anything to yes, add just, to that? I, I strongly, I haven't got the evidence for this, but I hope we will in a few years. I strongly suspect there are way more younger patients than we realise because people cope or hide it for a long time because they, they're embarrassed and everything else. And certainly um, one of the stories from people who have open clinics have said they've been really surprised by the number of younger people coming forward with leg problems. It's a much bigger problem than we've realized. And until we start to provide services and we start to collect data on things like age and that sort of thing, we don't really know the extent of the problem. But I suspect, I think you had a very extreme example, didn't you, Tracy? Yours was dramatic. But I, I very much, I suspect there are a lot more people than have presented originally. And talking about your dogs, I know we were talking last week because I was grumbling um, because our dogs had surgery and he's he's very enthusiastic pup and he's wandering around with this great big coat on. Well, he wasn't wandering around with his coat on his head. If he was wandering, I would have been able to avoid him. <laughs> but he was hurtling into me. I'm covered in bruises. And I was I was whinging away to you, wasn't I, Tracy, about my damn dog and his his large coat and the, the damage it was doing to my legs. And then you said, oh, yes, I remember that when mine were young. And I thought, oh, my God, can you imagine having leg ulcers? And having to cope with that as well. It just doesn't bear thinking about or vulnerable legs. It's just it was bad enough on my legs. But I was what? on edge for a lot of a lot of time. You were. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I, 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 developed, I developed a nervous twitch. I remember when you told me your story, I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> just at the wrong height as well. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I looked at my legs the other day and I covered in these horizontal bruises. And I thought, at least thank God I've, I've got healthy legs apart from the bruising. But I thought, what it must have been like for you. I just cannot imagine. But I think it is. I think there are, it'll be interesting, hopefully in five years time or more, we may know more about that, but you're right. And people, t I think, don't think it's helpful. People think of it as an older person's illness. Yes, there are a lot of people with older things, but, but actually a lot of our older people as well are very active. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a new grandma. You know, I, I would hate it if my, you know, if I was, my legs were smelly and my grandchildren, you didn't understand. It would just be awful. So I think we've got to be very broad in how we look at this and definitely think about the impact across all ages. Of course, the other thing is that um, we have we do have a significant number of enough people who are um, who misuse drugs. And if you've been injecting drugs into your legs for a long time, that can um, that can really create problems with your age. You may have got over your drug problem um, and moved on in your life. But you know, you're left with the damage. And I know Jamel Geraghty is doing some wonderful work to actually identify this. And again, it's a group of patients that we really, whether they've got over their drug problems or not, who deserve better care than they're getting at the moment. And a lot of those are very young. Um, two more questions that have come in. I know we're meant to be finishing at half past, but I think we can just carry on for a few minutes longer if that's okay both. Um, there's a question there about, probably for you, Una, what are the challenges considering distinct types and etiologies of wounds in the strategy? Yeah, um, I think the challenges are, a part, first problem is getting a correct diagnosis. So that's the first thing. Um, too often patients, it's quite surprising when we look at the data we've got, how many patients... They might have leg ulcer, or they might have leg ulcer, but it doesn't tell you what type of leg ulcer. And the treatment is completely different. So that's one of the challenges. Another challenge is getting people, um, we can only do so much in clinics and you know we may need vascular surgeons, lymph lymphedema experts. It's getting people, podiatrists, getting people to the right place for other parts of their care. And I think as well, there's um, compression for a large proportion of patients with low legs is going to be really important. And from clinicians, there's a real fear from clinicians about doing harm. And they tend not to think about the harm that from withholding an, an effective intervention as well. So we've really got to do something about helping people be more confident about both diagnosis and then about selecting appropriate therapies and implementing those appropriate therapies and helping patients cope with that. Some therapies are uncomfortable initially. I mean, if you've got appendicitis, an appendicectomy is not a walk in the park, but it's the appropriate care. You get analgesia, you get support to get you through the necessary surgical treatment. And we need to think the same with the therapy therapies we offer for these patients. If somebody's going to compression, they're probably going to need increased analgesia until that compression starts to take effect. So we need, there's all sorts of challenges, but we're really hoping that if we, skill up and give people the space to become good at this then they will be more useful to the patients they're caring or providing care to 
one more for you, Una, before I do some final questions to you both to finish off with, which is there is a, quite a challenge, really. There's a National Diabetic Foot Care oh, Audit. There is. We? We're going to do better than that. We're going to do better. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> Audits are all very well, but they have to be conducted and they're very timely to do it. Our plan is that actually, if we get the metrics right, and um, we are able to pull data into um, the systems in the appropriate way, which is looking extremely likely. Well, it's not just likely, it's gonna happen. Um, it's just working out the detail of how to make that happen. Effectively, what we will have is an ongoing live audit of lower limb care, including diabetic foot ulcers, that happens all the time. And it doesn't even need to be conducted about filling in forms because the data will be automatically drawn into the model hospital, model healthcare system. So you'll be able to go and look at your date, live data. We may not quite be live. It might be a, a few weeks old because it does take a bit of time for the coders to do it. But pretty much live data all the time. So you will be able to track what's going on with your service at any point in time. Wouldn't that be great? I think that's better than the National Foot Care Audit. I'm sorry, but I do. <laughs> so that not that I was heavily great. involved in it at all, Una. I don't know. No, no. <laughs> But the National Foot Diabetic or Foot Oil is good, but actually the technology is there now to do even better. So let's it is, it's absolutely. It's next generation audit, I think, you know, yeah. I think it's the, yeah. the ob obvious thing to do next. I do so, them, really. <laughs> just thinking, as because we're meant to finish up for half past, but I just want to ask each of you the same question, really. What are you? So I'll try it with you, Tracy, in terms of what, what as a patient, what are your hopes for the uh, National Wound Care Strategy? I think along with Legs Matter, um, I hope that it can change the future of wound care. Um, I've, I was lucky enough to have good care and consistent care um, and my ulcer still went on for many, many years. Um, but if I'd had to suffer that chronic pain, along with having inconsistent care and not trusting the people that were supposed to be helping me and perhaps not seeing a specialist um, and not having the support that I did have, um, I think that's terrible for anyone, anyone to go through. Um, I'd like to personally, um, I feel as if I've got an opportunity to speak for patients that haven't got the voice and, and haven't had this opportunity like I, I have. And I'm grateful that I'm part of Legs Matter and of the National Wound Care Strategy Programme because I feel like, you know, I can help to make that difference for future patients. Thank you, Tracy. Una, the same question to you. What's, what's your ultimate hope for the National Wound Care Strategy? What's the end game for us? Well, the end game is we are a time-limited programme, and that's maybe unusual that we recognise we are a time-limited programme. We've only got another three years, 11 months funding. So we are extremely focused on delivering a programme that basically puts good quality care as business as usual because it shouldn't be something, it's something you just do because it's just the right thing to do and the what service you're working in is set up to enable that to happen. So I want to be able to fully retire in four years time, knowing that we've actually established a service with metrics and clinics and what, everything else and pathways that actually is self-sustaining and doesn't need a program to keep it going because it's there and it's recognized as being the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you share the sort of feelings of most of the people involved in this, really. A lot of, certainly from a Legs Matter perspective, we all came together under your guidance initially, uh, Una, as a, as a coalition because we wanted to improve the care for patients and we wanted to make a difference because we recognised there was problems and issues with some of the services that patients were being delivered. And it's grown from strength to strength as a Legs Matter coalition, but obviously the National Wound Care Strategy is the next phase for us in terms of delivering that on, on some of those things. And Legs Matter sits there to to sort of, sort of monitor what you do, I suppose, and be a critical friend, if you like. Well, you. We, and... we regard you as very much as our very close critical friends. And in fact, and one thing I haven't mentioned, actually, which probably is worth mentioning, is we finally got agreement to have a nice clinical guideline for lower limb wounds. So, um, and again, I will be looking to Legs Matter and people like that to help, you know, to recommend to Nice and Sign that these are the obvious people to go and work with because you know what you're talking about. And so you have saved us a great deal of work and in having Legs Matter here to come and talk with and bounce ideas off and spread the word, really. So we're very grateful. In fact, we're trying to do something something similar really needs to happen for pressure ulcers as well, but that's a conversation for another day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, needed. it's needed. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think we've got all the questions from the, the chat. Um, any final thoughts from either of you or... 
anything you'd like to say to finish off? I think that the, the, the landmark thing about talking about nice was actually a good good point to finish on there, and to say that actually we're going to get a nice guideline for yeah. for, for the for lower limb care is really, and you know, it shows how far the national wound care strategy has come from that two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. pounds three years ago to actually get a nice guideline in place is a real uh, a real credit to this group, you know, because I've just come off a call from Nice, and um, one of the people on there said, "I cannot believe you actually got that." He said, because they are, they're not, you know, they, they're so hard to get NICE to agree to do a new clinical guideline, you know, or to do some work. And to be honest, it's all credit. To, it's not, it's, it's not me. It's the whole group of us together. We have been such a persistent nuisance and in driving this forward and just keep asking and asking and asking. And eventually it, you make it happen. So I think there's a lesson there for all of us. Just keep pushing, because if we all work together, we can, we can achieve amazing stuff. Brilliant. Sorry, to, we've got one for the further question which has just come through on Facebook, which I don't see access to, so it's just come through late. How will patients access these new service hubs? Will it be open access? I hope so. That's certainly what we're pushing. There's one other question, actually, Paul, which just come up in the chat, and somebody's asked for updates for the National Wound Care Strategy Programme. Um, if you live in England, you can, um, if you go onto our website, you can sign up to, as to our, one of our stakeholder forums. If you live outside England, we can't let you sign up because we're only supposed to consult in England. But what you can do is you have open access to our website and just keep an eye on it. And follow us on Twitter. We tweet a lot. So that will also alert you. So I hope that's helpful. Really useful. Great. I don't think there's any further questions. So I'd just like to thank both the panellists for an excellent sort of 35 minutes of conversation. And for both of you giving up your valuable time. I know you're really busy people. So... Uh, on behalf of Legs Matter, I'd like to thank Una and Tracy for giving up the time. And hopefully people found this a really useful uh, 40 minutes of, of conversation. Uh, thank you again, both. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>